Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus frutus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hormotis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast Mass. On this, as we said, the Feast of Saint Louis. King and Confessor, Ninth of his name of France. To an energetic and prudent rule, Louis added love and zeal for the practice of piety and the reception of the Holy Sacraments. Brave in battle, polished at feasts, addicted to fasting and mortification, his politics were grounded upon strict justice unshatterable fidelity and untiring effort toward peace. Nevertheless, his was not a weekly rule, but one that left its impress upon following generations. He was a great friend of religious orders, a generous benefactor of the church. The bravery says of him, he had already been king for 20 years when he fell victim to a severe illness. That afforded the occasion for making a vow to undertake a crusade for the liberation of the Holy Land. Immediately upon recovery, he received the Crusader's cross from the hand of the Bishop of Paris, and followed by an immense army, he crossed the sea in 1248. On the field of battle, Louis routed the Saracens. Yet when the plague had taken large numbers of his soldiery, he was attacked and taken captive in 1250. The king was forced to make peace with the Saracens. Upon the payment of a huge ransom, he and his army were again set at liberty. While on a second crusade, he died of the plague, with these words from the psalm upon his lips, I will enter thy house, I will worship in thy holy temple, and sing praises to thy name. The liturgy, invariably, is very reluctant in granting titles and dignities. Mention is made of such only if the title in question is part of some eminent office, and if a special consecration is given, e.g. of a bishop or a pope. Kings, too, of course, are sacred through consecration and holy anointing at their, con at their coronations. Therefore, the dignity of kingship among the saints is not overlooked. A nation's king shares in the sovereign ruling power of God and Christ. For this reason the church since ancient times has honoured kingship and has permitted special prayers to this end in her liturgy. Obedience to the king is not mere service of men but a service rendered to God. The church takes note if some saintly king busy with the cares of state does not forget the one thing necessary. If amidst the temptations of the world he faithfully observes God's law. His death is seen as a translatio, i.e. a transfer from an earthly kingdom to the glory of the heavenly kingdom. And so we pray today that all of us might become co-heirs of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, as we prayed in the Collect. The propers of this Mass are taken from the Common of Confessors, the, mass, the Missa Os Justi, but nevertheless the two proper readings are given ample grounds to entitle today's formulary the Common of Kings. In its historical context, the lesson from the Book of Wisdom tells of Joseph, whom God liberated from prison in Egypt and gave the scepter of the kingdom. This can easily be accommodated, of course, to the life of St. Louis, for he was taken captive by the Saracens. Recounting the parable of the gold pieces and the nobleman who went to obtain for himself a kingdom, the gospel, again, is easily accommodated to our saint. To grasp the historical allusions of this parable, a knowledge of the political conditions at the time of Christ is needed. Palestine was then under the dominion of Rome, and whoever hoped to become king of any given Jewish province was obliged to go into 
a far country, meaning to go to Rome, to receive for himself that kingdom and to return, in other words, to receive from the hand of the emperor the right to rule. It would happen on occasion that the inhabitants of the province would send a delegation to Rome with the petition, we do not wish this man to be king over us. If, nevertheless, the aspirant gained his end, it was taken for granted, according to the Eastern mind, that harsh treatment would be meted out to the objectors. Such the historical background of our parable. But how does the liturgy apply it? The nobleman who went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom is Christ, who, since his ascension, is sitting at the right hand of the Father, but of course will return on the last day. To us, his servants, he consigns the care of his goods, various graces and natural abilities, and upon his return he will ask of us an accounting. The parable lists three types of Christians. First, those who make perfect use of the graces given, as for instance St. Louis. In reward, he receives sovereignty over ten cities, by which is signified the heavenly reward, in which we may share by means of the Mass. The second group are those who put their gifts to good use. Surely we try to be among these. But the third group, those who do not cooperate with grace, are the bad Christians. A sobering warning to us. The primary lesson of the parable is that men must cooperate with grace to obtain salvation. Christianity does not consist in attendance at Mass and in the reception of the sacraments, but acting and living in a way pleasing to God is just as necessary. The Holy Eucharist which we receive is a gold piece, which the Lord entrusts to us throughout the day that we might work with it and trade with it, to profit with it for increase. Tomorrow he will come again and give us the chance to show our gains. And this spiritually we do at the offertory of the Mass. Just as there is a special priesthood and a priesthood common to all, so there is a special and a common kingship. For in varying degrees we all partake in the kingship of Christ. Our anointing with chrism, at baptism and confirmation, was our royal consecration. This anointing conferred upon us the royal, the priestly and the prophetic dignity. Here on earth, however, our royal dignity is hidden. Only hereafter will it be evident how we, with Christ, are kings. Today, then, will be an excellent occasion to consider how we should exercise our common kingship with Christ here on earth. Again, to quote from the breviary, In all truth, the just are kings, great kings. The reason? Because they do not yield complacently to temptations, but have learned how to triumph over them. In all truth, the just, meaning those who keep God's law, who cooperate and collaborate with his grace, are kings, great kings. The reason? Because they do not yield complacently to temptations, but have learned how to triumph over them. The Christian life, my brothers and sisters, is all about that struggle and tussle, that constant warring for control 
of ourselves. About triumphing over our faults, our weaknesses, our failings, our temptations. Every day, we are given an opportunity to prove ourselves. Prove ourselves as servants worthy of our master's trust and confidence in us. Note, my brothers and sisters, that this parable, like the parable of the five talents, how the master entrusts his servants with stewardship over his goods. Remember that the first vocation of humanity seen in Adam was stewardship over creation. And likewise, as we have reflected many times before, read the evangelical counsel derived from the gospel of poverty, the spirit of poverty and the detachment from material things is realized how? By recognizing that we are but stewards of God's providence. We are but stewards of the temporal material things of this world. As elsewhere the scripture reminds us, and as we hear often at funerals, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out. Everything, as it were, is lent to us. But it's not just lent to us, it is entrusted to us. Christ our King entrusts to us. The stewardship of his kingdom. That kingdom of God that is where? Not there or there, but in us. How often, my brothers and sisters, have you considered, reflected, thought for yourself, what is your relationship with Jesus, who is your King? What does it mean for you to carry his kingdom within you? How often do you consider, do you remember the, the material things you enjoy from God's providence are only lent to you, entrusted to you, that you are only a steward of them? And what's more, that you have control over them, you do not fully possess them. They aren't technically yours. <clears throat> they are what has been apportioned to you to steward on behalf of your royal king and master. How difficult it is, my brothers and sisters, for us to dispossess ourselves of material attachment. How many of us really most of the time consider that what we have, what is within our purview, is in fact ours to do with as we please. How many of us ever spare a thought to think, oh hold on a minute, 
technically this isn't mine. Technically, this has only been entrusted to me. Technically, I'm supposed to make a profit for someone else, not me. For notice again, that with this parable of the ten servants, as with the parable of the five talents, the good servants not only take care of that which has been entrusted to them, but they also make it profitable. The best of them double what they were entrusted with. See, Lord, you gave me five talents. See how I have made five talents besides. But what is this profit? Well, just as it's important to remember that the parables are parables, that means that the talents, or indeed the gold coins, are symbolic. They mean something else. What do they mean? <coughs> they mean salvation. They mean God's grace and favour. So then, what does it mean for us to make a profit, a return, as it were, for the entrusting and the investing of God's grace and salvation to us? Well, surely it means, of course, to have enabled the salvation of others. So what does that mean? It means then that that which we have been entrusted with, both material and temporal and spiritual, is meant to profit for God's will. In other words, as we've reflected before, we are to use what we have been given stewardship of to increase the kingdom of God. Meaning that everything then should be purposed to realize his sovereign will. Some of you may recall this past Lent, how we reflected very several times on detachment from material things, and how I suggested that Lent was a good time not just for decluttering the soil of our souls, read the parable of the sower, but also an opportunity to declutter our lives, particularly our home and domestic environment to get rid of those things which are really distractions that prevent us from growing the seed of the word of God within us. Those things that distract us, those things that uh, tempt us, those things that are not profitable to us spiritually. But in the exercise of that, I suggested that then one might look at things, at material things, objects, objets d'art, etc., and ask, is this necessary to affect God's will, either for me or for anyone else? How does this help God's will be realised? for me and others. And we said at the time, now of course, things that, for example, enable us to live, these are necessary to realise God's will. It is necessary for us to have nourishment, to have sustenance, 
It is necessary for us uh, to have clothing, to be sheltered. These things are necessary. These things sustain the physical aspect of our lives. And we need them in order to be alive, to serve God. Therefore, quid pro quo, these are necessary to effect God's will. But are they all necessary? When we look at the great horde, and we do all tend of us, all of us tend to be hoarders. When we look at the great horde of stuff that we have, do we need all of it? Do we really need umpteen pairs of shoes when one pair will suffice? Indeed, St. John Chrysostom says uh, that if you have more than one pair of shoes and another has not, you are stealing from them. Think about that for a moment. What he means is, of course, that that which has been entrusted to you, given to you out of God's providence, but which you don't need, you have a responsibility, a moral duty to use the excess to profit the kingdom, to use the excess to give to someone else, to realize God's will. For in that giving, you are realizing God's will, and for them, you are realizing God's will that they be clothed fed, sustained, nourished, sheltered, etc. This is a good exercise, not just in Lent. Remember that the disciplines and the lessons we learn in Lent are not just for a season, but are supposed to be for the rest of our lives. As I say, the beginning of every Lent, or indeed the beginning of Jessima, the pre-season of Lent, the aim and the hope is that we don't next year have to repeat the same disciplines to address the same sins. So what we learn in Lent, we should then continue with in our lives until such time as a lesson is learned. I wonder how many of us between Lent this year and now have acquired, hoarded once more, more than we need, more than is necessary to effect God's will for our lives. But always think, how may this benefit another? How may this help realise God's will for another? And that's why we should not be wasteful, but rather regard everything as having potential to serve God's will. It is much better to give things away to others to use than simply to throw them and discard them away in the rubbish. So if you have excess shoes, excess clothes, excess food, even excess money, the prudent thing to do as a steward of God is to reflect for a moment and consider who do I know that could make use of these things? What, do, what project do I know of? What apostolate or ministry do I know of that would use these things to affect God's will? Remember, my brothers and sisters, that we are called as Christians to be countercultural. We should not be following the contemporary zeitgeist of a disposable society. 
Rather for us, prudent and careful stewardship of material things means considering always their utility for God's will and service. And of course, all this is summed up as we generally call such giving away of things, charity. Because what is God's will? God's will is God's love. It's that God's love be known, God's love be shared. That means that with these material things, whatever they may be, may be used to effect God's will. In other words, to realize God's love, either in us or for us, or for another. This is true charity. This is the proper respect and attitude we should have for material things. But the hardest and most important aspect of it all is for ourselves to inculcate a sense of detachment from these things. On um, the old Roman.com, uh, I think a couple of days ago, if not yet, I think it's a couple of days ago, we shared a film from New Zealand of Transal uh, Transalpine Redemptorist Monastery. It's about an hour long uh, and it beautifully describes the life of these missionary monastics. But they interview a young novice, 19, and he explains that he is not allowed to possess anything. Indeed, even the name given to him in religion, he is not to regard possessively. He says, everything that is given to me to wear, to use, is temp is not mine even he says the name given to me in religion even that is not mine and here my brothers and sisters is the truth of course of what our lord says to us when in the gospel he says where your treasure is there is your heart also. And what is our treasure? But love of God, the desire for communion with God, for true union with God, for unity with God, for oneness with God, for wholeness with God. And this should be our heart's desire, of course, not just for the future, but in the present. What the young novice is learning and realising is that communion with God must be desired always and can be realised now. The life of King Louis, ninth of his name, King of France and Confessor of Christ, is a very intriguing and interesting life indeed. I commend you to spend a few minutes today reading about his many accomplishments and achievements but note chiefly his clear desire to serve God's will. For which reason this parable of 
the ten coins or this parable of the ten servants is given us today. You will read in the life of St. Louis how he did not waste a single thing that by God's divine providence had been entrusted to him, yea, even as an anointed king. How he did not sit back, as it were, and rest on the laurels that had been given to him. How he did not simply please himself, having been so greatly blessed by God, but instead used everything, including of his own person, his own energy, his own body, his own strength, to serve God's will. For sure, there are critics of King Louis as well. Being a saint doesn't mean always getting everything right. Every saint has a past, as the meme says. But the point is, every sinner has a future. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the lesson for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.